Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar this week on 5th of August, 2021. I'm Maren Bremer, a colleague of Fadi who cannot make it today. So it's my pleasure to host you all together with Sebastian Geiger from Harriet Watt again. We're especially grateful to all our keynote lecturers who have accepted our invitation before and to all of you joining our webinar this week. So please subscribe also to our YouTube channel so you're also uh, up to date with the upcoming talks. And I would like to introduce the lecture today. So this week we are pleased to announce the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Kaita Yoshioka. Kaita is a senior researcher at the UFSAT, the Helmut Center for Environmental Research in Germany and Leipzig. And he is working on computational geochemechanics. He joined the UFZ in 2017 and is working on fracture mechanics undertaking in the subsurface. Before his current academic life, he had been a more practitioner in the industry for a very long time. So Kaita worked with Chevron, for example, for more than 10 years and their technology center in Houston. And he uh, conducted internal consulting for different fields in Mexico, offshore Brazil, Venezuela, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, and worked basically on geomechanical problems. Also in 2008 already, he was seconded to Chevron's then geothermal operation in Indonesia, and he supervised hydraulic stimulation over there in the field. He received his Bachelor of Science in Resource and Environmental Engineering from the Waseda University in Japan, and his PhD in Petroleum Engineering from Texas AM University in 2007. It's our pleasure and honor to host you, Kaita, in our Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar this week. To all of you, please note this lecture will last again for about 30 minutes, followed by questions and a discussion. Like before, please type your questions as early as possible, as early as they pop up in our chat room, and Sebastian will go through them after the talk. So, Kaita, thanks once more, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Maren, for a kind introduction. Um, yeah, I have to confess that I'm a big fan of this webinar series. So I have watched uh, many of the series, many of the uh, lectures on this series on YouTube. So um, I, I think it's great that uh, you guys are doing this uh, during this pandemic. So yeah, so as I, um, as Marin introduced, I have worked in oil and gas industry for many years. And some of you may be wondering, what is someone like me doing in an environmental research center now? Um, so I point to this cartoon that describes subsurface utilization related to energy transition. And I think many of the items, topics here have been touched, up, touched upon in this webinar series before. Um, so I was involved in hydrocarbon extraction and my expertise is geomechanics and especially uh, fracture mechanics. And in hydrocarbon extraction or geothermal energy development, fracture is something um, we deliberately create. But for storage of energy or CO2 or nuclear waste disposal, fracture is something we want to avoid to ensure our geomechanical integrity. And if we cannot avoid it, uh, we need to know the extent of its propagation to properly assess the risk. So in a sense, I'm looking, I'm still looking at the same problem, um, fracture, but from a different perspective. And in hydraulic fracturing, uh, we initiate fractures through perforations or by setting packers. And uh, I'd like to highlight here that uh, in energy or waste storage operation, that's, that is not the case. We don't initiate the fractures. In other words, we don't know where fractures might possibly initiate. So that brings us to one of the focuses of my talk today, um, fracture initiation. And uh, I'd like to talk about fracture initiation and propagation in porous media, and particularly using a numerical tool called variational phase field model. So our objective is to develop a predictive tool for complex fracture in both 2D and 3D with a viable numerical scheme. And by complex, I mean a fracture that turns or branches or march. <clears throat> so here's a concept proposed by Wapinski et al. in 2008. So this is a top view. And uh, if, we, um, if we have a um, borehole and then 
for the simple fracture, we have this, this kind of bi-wing fracture. But from the, um, <clears throat> the micro seismicities observation or production record, uh, this simple fracture is not always the case. And there's a growing evidence that the fracture might be more complex or might be interacting with the fissures or um, pre-existing natural uh, fractures. So it may form this kind of complex fracture network. And this was a concept, but uh, we, we have some evidence now. So in the recent years, um, there was a hydraulic fracturing experiment where um, after the multi-stage fracking, uh, fracturing, they drilled um, uh, slim well to retrieve the cores. And then from the cores, uh, they found some complex fractures. So there are some evidence of the complex fractures. And I have observed complex fractures myself. So I took this picture um, in my neighborhood. So this is a local grocery store sign on a window. And then um, and those, um, those, those letters cracked and probably under some loadings, most likely the uh, thermal expansion of the window. Um, but notice that uh, there are no cracks in letters I because letter I's don't have any stress concentration. And the cracks initiated from the stress concentrations in other, other letters. And notice here that the middle bars of this E and P, um, the crack patterns look identical. And also notice here, the lower part of L, E, and Z. Again, the crack patterns look identical. Well, first I need to comment on the person who put up these stickers. Uh, he or she must, must have done a very good job to put them very precisely. But why are the crack patterns so consistent even though they are complex? So all the letters seem to have found a stable state with a minimum energy. And that stable state seems to be consistent. So this slide shows um, evolution of fracture modeling. So we used to model fracture in a very simple geometry. So the fracture called bi-wing fracture. So we only model one side of the fracture actually by assuming the symmetry on the both sides. And it's a planar fracture. And with time, uh, the modeling technology evolved. So from the single well uh, fracturing to multi-stage multi-welds and then interaction with natural fractures. But we should pay attention to um, fracture initiation and restrictions on the path. Most of the tools require initial fractures um, or some uh, initial fracture seed um, at the perforation point or lowest stress point. And fracture topology, um, it is mostly um, planar and uh, if it branches or merges, it requires some ad hoc criteria. So in the next few slides, uh, we will look into why do we have such limitations? Okay, so this equation uh, gives us a frac pressure required um, to propagate this line crack with half length A. And first we need to overcome the minimum stress and then we have this extra bit. And what is this extra bit? Um, so it is um, from the critical stress intensity factor in, in a denominator and it's a material prop, uh, property. And then um, it is divided by uh, square root of pi a. So this is uh, from the geometry. For, for a simple geometry like this uh, line crack, uh, it's given by this expression, but other geometries like a PKN, KGD, penny shape, there are different um, expressions. So formally, this is the criteria for fracture propagation. And left-hand side is a measure called stress intensity factor. It is computed based on the geometry. And then right-hand side, we have this critical stress intensity factor. And it's a material property and uh, interchangeably, it's often called fracture toughness. And for a line crack, the stress intensity factor is given by 
this expression. And um, if the crack is not this simple geometry, uh, how do we get stress intensity factor? So there's a handbook with a uh, three, uh, three volumes. Uh, so we can hope to find um, stress intensity factor that we're looking for in this handbook, hoping that uh, someone has worked, worked on it before, or we can uh, numerically compute the stress intensity factor too. But, um, <clears throat> but if you start thinking about many realization of fracture propagation, this computation becomes very costly. So this is, this is one reason, not only, but uh, one reason that it is often convenient to impose some restrictions on fracture propagation path. And uh, it's not a theoretical limitation, but there are pract practical reasons to do it. And now let's um, look at the fracture initiation. So fracture initiation means that uh, we bring, <coughs> we send this uh, crack length to zero. And if we send this crack length A to zero, uh, we, we get infinite here. Um, so theoretically, fracture initiation is not possible. Okay, so now let us go back to the original fracture criteria, which was proposed by Griffith in 1921. And the stress-based criteria is actually derived from the energy-based criteria. And the energy-based criteria, we compute a quantity so-called uh, energy release rate, which is defined as the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the crack growth. And when it reaches the critical value, then the crack propagates. And the energy release rate can be converted to the stress intensity factor, so it's a critical stress, uh, so it's a critical energy release rate. So there's a one-to-one -one conversion. So Left hand side is geometry, and then this uh, quantity requires um, initial crack geometry to compute. And then right hand side is a material property. Now uh, we look at the fracture propagation from a different point of view. So this was the Griffith criteria. When the energy release rate reaches some critical value, fracture propagates. So that's the criteria. And Frankfurt and Marigold proposed a variational approach to fracture in 1998. So this criteria, um, the Griffith criteria, essentially tells us to find the minimum point. If we define the total energy as a sum of the potential energy and surface energy, The minimum energy with respect to crack A, that is identical to the Griffith criteria. So Frankfurt, Frankfurt and Marigo recast the Griffith criteria into an energy minimization problem. But this criteria still deals with a single crack propagation. And what if, if we have a multiple cracks or a crack branches? instead of looking at one single crack, we can consider all the fractures. So now we can define the total energy as a um, sum of potential energy and surface energy, but the surface energy now includes all the fractures in the system instead of one crack. So this, this can be considered as a generalized Griffith criteria. And by recasting the um, original problem into, into the energy minimization problem, we can achieve following things. So the fraction initiation and propagation as a is energy minimization problem. And now we don't have any restrictions on a fracture topology or number of fractures. So now that the fracture criteria set up as a total energy minimization without any restrictions on the topology and does not require initial fractures. And how do we go about implementation? So the crack is a discontinuity and um, we don't like discontinuities in continuum mechanics because they are discontinuous. And uh, this discontinuity evolves so implementing this evolving discontinuity 
is a daunting task. In 2000, uh, Bodin et al. regularized the problem using a faithful variable. We call it B here. So in this figure, we have discrete crack. And this discrete crack is represented, um, well, it's, it's a gamma represent a discrete crack. And by introducing a faithful variable, um, this sharp image of the crack is kind of blurred or diffused in the face field representation. And instead of this binary representation of crack, now we have a smooth or diffused representation of the crack. So the face field variable zero along the crack that represent crack and one away from the crack. But instead of crack or not crack, zero or one, it can have a body between zero and one. And by introducing this phase field variable, the uh, energy functional can be regularized using the regularization length parameter L. So this regular, regularization length parameter, um, if we send this L to zero, then these two problems become equivalent. And if we extend this to hydraulic fracturing, we need to add an um, extra term uh, that accounts for the work done by the fluid pressure within the fracture. So this becomes our total energy in hydraulic fracturing um, problem. So here I will, um, talk a little bit about how we um, numerically implement this minimization problem. So this is our implementation. Um, it's not the only way to implement it. Uh, there are some other ways, um, but we look at the first order necessary condition for the energy functional to be minimum. So we, we, set, um, we take the directional derivatives and we set it to zero with inequality constraints. And inequality constraints, uh, so the phase field variable B has to be bounded between zero and one. And then this evolution should be strictly negative because of the irreversibility. And taking advantage of the fact that uh, this energy functional is a biconvex, it's convex to U and convex to V, we do alternate minimization. So we first solve for displacement by by setting the variation of B equal to zero. And then we solve for B by setting the variation of displacement equal to zero. And we iterate until it, um, it converges. So there are two um, key ingredients in our numerical approach. So the first one is the, um, um, we, we, we recast the Griffith um, criteria into the energy minimization problem. So it's not, uh, it's also, it's called variational approach. So we are doing the energy minimization and we use, well, we regularize this minimization using the phase field variable. Um, but this is not the only way to achieve this energy minimization. There are some other approaches have been proposed but um, by far the faithful um, method um, is the most popular approach by now. So how is the fracture represented with face field? So if we have a sharp crack, sharp line crack like this, and then this is a face field um, representation of the crack. And if we look at the face field profile, along this uh, scan line, and this is how it looks. So the phase field variable is one away from the crack, and then it's zero at the crack. And then there's some transition um, zone that changes the, um, the phase field variable changes from zero to one. And then this transition length is controlled by the regularization length. So, the question now is, can we still recover explicit properties? So with a diffused crack, how can we um, define such explicit properties? 
like a uh, fracture aperture or volume or critical um, pressure or, or frac pressure. So the fracture aperture is a displacement jump across the crack surface. And since the crack surface is diffused, we recover this by taking this integral. And we verify this fracture aperture computation against the closed form solution. So this vertical axis is the fracture aperture, and then X axis is a distance along the crack. And uh, this dashed line is um, analytical solution, the closed form solution from Sinedon. And then we computed fracture aperture with um, different mesh size. So these um, different colors of lines represent um, result from a different mesh size. Um, notice here that um, our fracture aperture um, is, is in the order of E, e minus four. And uh, we are able to recover this fracture aperture using even a, a mesh with, with the order of E minus two. So if we were to use a um, discrete approach to represent the fracture, fracture aperture would be the um, order of the size of the element that we have to use. But using this diffused approach, we can get away with much coarser element, much bigger element, uh, even the two orders magnitude bigger element, we are still able to represent this small fracture opening. And these two uh, figures on the bottom, uh, we compared pressure response. So this is a pressure versus injected volume. And this is a crack length uh, versus injected volume and uh, with different size of mesh. And um, yeah, so we, we are able to verify the model that uh, it is able to calculate fracture lengths and also the critical um, fracture propagation pressure. So now we will look at some example. The first example I'm, I will show here is fracture initiation. So it's a formation of mechanical joint. So we can't find such mechanical joints in outcrop. And this is considered to be a set of tensile fractures in a brittle layer. So we constructed the simple 2D model with a weak layer in the middle. And by weak, I mean smaller fracture toughness. And we, we vary both mechanical properties and, and geometric parameters, such as a layer thickness of the weak layer. And this is one example um, of our simulation. So we, we pull this layer from uh, both sides. And in the beginning, um, damage sort of um, develop homogeneously. And then this damage starts localizing. And then the uh, space, um, <clears throat> this fracture continuously um, fill the space between these joints. And then at some point, it reaches some saturation point. And after this saturation point, there's no more <clears throat> new fracture developing and then existing fracture, um, this uh, layer debonding. So it starts forming some shear fractures and then um, some layer debonding. So the mode of fracture uh, changed from mode one to mode two here. And we can also count a number of fractures in the layer. And, and that, um, so we, we did some counting um, and uh, we plotted the frequency against average fracture spacing. Uh, and it seems to follow a negative exponential um, distribution function. And that seems to agree with field observation. So my geologist friend asked me what happened in 3D. And I did this quickly a while ago and I haven't really gone anywhere since, but uh, this, is, this is what I have done. So I, I set up the model, um, the same model in 3D and I first pulled this model in this direction, then I stopped. So that was my first episode. And then second episode, I rotate um, by 90 degrees and then I pulled in this direction. 
and and this is um, this is what I got. So okay, so this this boundary, uh, please ignore this um, weird looking fracture. This this is a um, boundary was too close. But uh, this big fracture. These are the fractures created by first episode, and we can consider them as an older fracture set. And then um, these shorter fractures, uh, they were created in this loading, um, and they are considered to be younger set of fracture. And you notice that the younger fracture sets tend to be terminated by the older fracture set. And this is consistent with the field um, observation. But um, in our practice now, when we generate natural fracture, uh, we use some uh, statistical approach, and then we sort of randomly um, place the fractures. Um, and yeah, so <clears throat> without without considering any any mechanics, right? So by by placing these fractures randomly um is can we still do such um random um you know statistical fracture generation that's that's a question okay another example of fracture initiation is about the discussion driven crack so we have a saturated clay sample uh, placed on the plate with constraints and then we let the water evaporate And um, so, so this is an experiment, and this is the top view. Um, so we then we consider unsaturated flow with capillary effects, and uh, as the water evaporates, and that induces negative pressure, and then sample starts shrink. And first, uh, we get this um, uh, cracking on on this corner, left corner, and. Uh, then we get this vertical cracks. So this is what uh, we we simulated. So first we get this um, left corner cracks, and then we get these um, vertical cracks. And I I like to highlight here that uh, so so this is the computational mesh we used. And as you can see, the mesh is very coarse. Um, it's less than four thousand elements, and material is completely homogeneous. Um, there's no heterogeneity in, in the material property, or we didn't put any defects in mesh or geometry that can initiate the fractures. So these fractures are purely initiated um, by, by minimizing the system energy. Okay, so now um, we will look at some examples of fracture propagation from an energetic point of view. And this is a hydrofracturing experiment done on a carbonate rock. So we have this rectangular sample, and then there's a borehole drilled in the middle. And then um, uniaxial loading is applied from um, top and bottom. And then um, there's a fluid injection into this borehole. And then um, the particle fracture is expected because um, orthogonal to the uh, loading direction. And the sample is 97% calcite, so it's almost homogeneous. And it's got some mineral inclusions or gr grains, and they are microfossils, and they are also made of calcite. So we can consider that uh, those inclusions have the same mechanical properties. Um, but these grains or inclusions seems to have some um, weak interface, because here in this picture, you can see that the hydraulic fracture is um, clearly influenced by the presence of the um, inclusions. And sometimes cracks uh, branches and sometimes crack uh, penetrates the grain. And also this picture shows um, how the fracture pattern looks like, looks like. And an interesting observation we observed, um, we, we made is the, um, as the fracture propagate, away from the well bore, um, it seems to increase the complexity. So um, near the well bore, uh, it's relatively straight, but um, 
as it propagates away from the whale bore, uh, it starts um, deflecting more or branching more. And we try to simulate this. What we we try to find out what's going on using using um, numerical simulation. So we set up a whale bore and we we took a half symmetry. Um, and then we place um, inclusion um, some distance away from the borehole. And this inclusion has the same material properties, um, but the interface toughness is weaker than the bulk material. And we consider different interface strengths of the inclusion. So first case, um, so we consider that the interface has only 20% of the strengths of the bulk material. And here's 10% and 5% here. And all the cases, hydraulic fracture just propagated straight, ignoring this inclusion. So it penetrates um, the inclusion. And uh, next, we place this inclusion a little bit farther away from the well bore. Then here's what happens. Um, so in 20% strength, 10% strength, it's same, the crack penetrates, but 5% strength, this time hydraulic fracture um, deflected at inclusion, even though the strength of the interface is same as this case. Only difference is the distance of this inclusion from the well bore. And we place this inclusion farther away from the well bore again. And in this time, the, even the 10% of the strength case, <clears throat> the crack deflects. So <clears throat> our simulation seems to be consistent with um, our observation of the experiments. <clears throat> so the fracture seems to deflect more easily if the inclusion is located farther away from the well bore. Um, but we, we want to know why, why this happens. So, okay, uh, this, is, this is not the simulation uh, or the phase field models. Um, I computed energy release rate of a deflecting crack manually and normalized by the penetrating case. So here's my calculation. Um, so this is the um, energy release rate of a deflecting crack. And this is the distance from the well bore. And this plot shows that the energy release rate of a deflecting crack increases with distance from the well bore. This means that the crack tends to, tends to deflect more as it propagates farther away from the borehole because the system wants to release as much, as much energy as possible by fracture propagation. So from an um, energetic point of view, the crack may take a more complex path as it propagates farther away from the open borehole. Okay, so this is my last example I want to show today. We look at the multi-fracturing problem. And um, so we, we consider infinite number of parallel cracks with the same spacing, with the same length, and we pressurize all the cracks evenly. So everything is equal and we expect perfectly symmetry results. And we even have a um, um, closed form expression and this closed form expression considers uh, symmetry. And you know, typically engineers like to take advantage of symmetry to reduce the computational cost. So this is the smallest um, domain um, by applying this symmetry, this is the smallest domain that we can um, consider. Um, so this is just a half size of this, and then this domain contains only um, one crack on the edge. And let's call this configuration omega one. And, uh, and this should be identical, even if we double the domain size, and we call this uh, omega two. And then um, this is omega four, so this is a four times of this omega one. So all, all of all of them should be identical um, because they are symmetry. So this is our simulation result. So the smallest domain 
omega one, we got this crack propagation. So we can reco reconstruct the original domain by applying the symmetry. So this omega one has one crack and then this crack propagated. So if we reconstruct the original geometry, that means that the, all the cracks propagate. And this is what we got from the omega two, which had uh, two cracks in the domain. So only this fracture propagated. So this means that uh, if we reconstruct the original domain by applying the symm symmetry again, this means that uh, only every other crack propagates. And what happens in omega four, this domain, again, only one of the crack propagates. So this, again, in the whole domain, uh, it means that uh, only one out of three crack propagates. And so on, the same result for the, um, this configuration. So whatever domain we compute, only one of the cracks propagates. And this means that um, except for this configuration, all other cases broke the symmetry. Is it true? Um, we can certainly look at the pressure responses and the energy evolution in the system. So we have the um, closed form expression for the pressure. So this is the pressure um, evolution against the um, injected volume. And up to the uh, propagation point, all the cases show identical result. And only the configuration of all the cracks propagation, this omega one, matches the closed form expression. And any other cases show lower pressure. And we can also compare the uh, total energy in the system. So this, <clears throat> this orange line is the um, total energy from the omega one configuration. And so this is a symmetry case. And by breaking the symmetry, actually we have a lower state of energy. So up to the propagation point, all the cases have the identical response. But once the crack starts propagating, um, <clears throat> there's the uh, always lower state of energy that, okay, um, the, if, if we have a fewer crack propagating, that gives us a lower state of energy. So if a computation domain was given a choice, it would always choose a lower state of energy by breaking the symmetry. So this is what happens. So I should point out that uh, all these computations were done in so-called toughness dominated fracture regime where the, uh, where the pressure dissipation <clears throat> is, <clears throat> is not considered. And we don't know if this loss of symmetry is real, uh, but from an energetic point of view, a symmetric growth gives, always gives, gives us a lower state of energy. And this is a hydraulic fracture experiment um, done the penny shape crack experiment done in the PMMA. And you, you can see that the, even this um, penny shape, it's not centered at the injection point. It's a little bit off centered. And this, this is not a Japanese flag. Uh, this is a simulation of the penny shape crack. And we, we also um, saw that um, this penny shape crack is off centered. And the question is, if it's so easy to do symmetry in even in a perfectly homogeneous setting, um, can we still consider um, symmetric fracture propagation in a more realistic setting where we have, you know, uh, material heterogeneity or defects and so on? Okay, so this concludes uh, my talk. So the variational and phaseful model is an appealing predictive tool for fracture initiation and complex fracture formation. And this approach, phase field model, is becoming very, very popular these days and has been extended beyond this original elastic brittle material. And um, yeah, with the risk of being unfair, I should still try to acknowledge some people um, 
Blaze, Chakudi, Ewan, Mostafa, and Tuani, and also um, Open Geosis development team. And uh, I'm very grateful for all the funding agencies listed here. Okay, um, so that's all I have, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Kaita. I think that was a very interesting talk, and I guess there are some questions. Uh, I will hand over to Sebastian first. Yes, um, thank you very much as well from, from my side, Kaita, for a really interesting, interesting talk at tackling a very tough, and it's not pun intended, but very difficult computational problem. We do have a few questions from Siddhartha coming in, and I'm going to start with them. And they're actually not too far from, from what I was planning to ask you as well. So Siddhartha says, no, thank you for the talk. Can you comment on the implementation of the fluid problem for fluid pressure? Specifically, where does it fit in the alternate in the alternate minimization? Um, is there any justification for your choice? Okay, so yeah, I didn't I didn't talk much about fluid implementation. Uh, so it's um, yeah, it takes some time, but uh, essentially this alternate minimization does not change, and um, so so the total energy we define is dependent on the fluid pressure. And uh, so in this case, we will solve the fluid pressure outside of this minimization scheme, and you can solve it in, well, actually there are, there are many approaches proposed. Um, and uh, so you, you solve your fluid pressure problem outside of this alternate minimization problem. And, and uh, one one important thing is the uh, so as as the fracture propagates, um, then of course it will change the permeability and porosity in the flow system, and then then your fluid system needs to account for this change. So as as the um, the phase field variable propagates, uh, as the phase field variable changes, and that represents fracture, and then your your fluid pressure. Um, system needs to account for this change um yeah so i um yeah i have i i can show you some slides but it's it's, it's just a lot of equations <laughs> okay but you look like you can you can deal with with uh, the um with the flow side with a change in with the feedback in in fluid mm -hmm. pressure great because that right. yeah that was this was the one question i had as well um well, Siddhartha has a follow-up question, but I'm going to um, go to one of, I'm going to come back to Siddhartha in a moment. I'm going to go um, to Leslie Gutierrez's questions. Um, this is related to what the model can and can't do. So Leslie says, thank you very much for the great talk. Thinking ahead, are you planning to consider thermal effects of fracture propagation and generation? So if you have thermal stresses, um, for example, around your yeah. wave, could you model that? Yeah, 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 and and uh, well, actually, um, people have done it, and I have done it already. So, essentially, the fracture propagation is driven by driven by the strain energy um, um, in a simplistic term, and then you can you can devise this strain energy um, considering the uh, poroelasticity elasticity or thermal elasticity, or you can also consider other other um, complex physical phenomena that, such as uh, plasticity or viscoelasticity. So um, as long as you devise the strain energy that drives the fracture propagation, uh, you can you can include other physics. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, coming back to no a question from Daniel Wong says, does the fracture initi initiation depend on the mesh geometry? Actually, yes, it, it does depend on the mesh geometry. Um, so that's why um, the um, that's why the um, fracture initiation example I showed today, I only use the structured mesh because yes, it will depend on the mesh geometry but it depends more on the mesh size um so if there um 
irregular size in the element, and uh, that that can yeah uh, that can impact your fracture initiation. Um, Does it impact the yeah, location so where the fractures initiate because you have whatever numerical noise in the convergence, or does it um, impact how the fractures actually propagate in the numbers of, of fractures as you cause and you know, change your mesh, mesh? Yeah, so, okay, so the fracture initiation is, okay, so, mm, how can I say so? <laughs> um, so we are, we, we, we look for um, minimum energy and uh, if we have a, if we have very even system, very homogeneous system, and in in such system, um, there are a lot of local energy minima, um, and uh, our implementation does not guarantee to find a global energy minima. We we can only find local energy minima, and but <clears throat> but uh, if you if you remember my example of broken broken letters of Leipzig. Um, so if there's some stress concentration in the domain, um, it's easy to find a minima because um, that's where the fracture likely to initiate. But um, my example for a mechanical joint system where you have, you know, like a almost randomly distributed fractures. In this case, um, if I, if I, if I repeat this simulation with a slightly different mesh many times, the exact location of the crack will always change. Yeah. It will yeah. always change. It, it will never be the same. Uh, but, uh, but, the, um, but average spacing or the number of fractures, uh, that will not change much because uh, that, has to be, that has to be the uh, uh, energy That's minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It brings us nicely sort of to questions that um, Kevin Bistam is asking. Um, Kevin says, unfortunately, it's part of your interesting, um, it's part of your talk, but interesting work and continues. It is my understanding that there's some challenges with upscaling, applying your method to real data set. Where do you see phase feed methods having edge or advantage, advantage use versus other fracture modeling methods? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I I understand that this upscaling means like a um, you know like a from laboratory scale to field scale maybe. Um, so 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 the advantage of the facial method or this kind of diffused approach is um, since we don't treat the fracture explicitly, so the mesh size can be big. Right. Um, so that's that's one advantage. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know what I uh, <laughs> I I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, but yeah, that's that that's one advantage. And and to 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 bridge the gap between love scale and field scale, yeah, it's um it's it's always a challenge. So I I showed one example of hydraulic fracturing experiment where a fracture is impacted by the presence of the grains. And if we want to do a same simulation in a field scale, and of course I cannot I cannot uh, consider each each grain size. Um, but then then I I want to highlight the advantage of using this phase field because um, so I I consider the grain uh, but if if I really want to consider each of the grain in other numerical approach uh, that um, explicitly consider fractures, then then I would have to use I would have have to use much more um, fine element. Um, and in that example I showed, I I, I was still able to use um, coarse mesh. So so that's one advantage of the phase field. And then I I didn't show much data, but there's there's also a pro, um, in in that. Simulation. I also used um, some approach to account for physical interface, um, some weak interface. Um, so, so those are the advantages in this approach. So, one of the questions I had, and I'm just going to follow up. There are plenty of more questions coming in, but one of the thoughts I had is, 
what is keeping us um, from using your methods in sort of almost day-to-day -day engineering? Because um, there's so many important applications. And we're thinking about designing radioactive waste repositories. We want to know that over time, there are no fractures forming as, as the repository heats, heats mm -hmm, up mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you showed you know, the, mm -hmm. the boreholes um, mm -hmm. more generally. One of the big questions everyone is always struggling with, with is what kind of fracture patterns could we find yeah. in the yeah. subsurface? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there a fundamental step that's missing that uh, general engineer, like I'm reservoir engineer, that I am could use your tools on a more regular basis? Um, is there something missing in the physics? Is it 2D to 3D, which you elaborated on, or is it all ready to go and we should also downloading open geosys and create our fracture networks? Yeah, so one thing I have to mention is this, this approach is still relatively new. Um, so the original, original model was proposed around 20 years ago. Um, and um, in the last five years or so, uh, it became very popular approach within the computational fracture community. Um, but since since the inception of, of, of this approach, first 10 years or so, people took this as with, with some skepticism um, mm -hmm. because you know the cracks are diffused and then uh, they don't they don't look um, so real and and um, so pe people didn't jump in right away but uh in the last five years or so uh this became this has become very popular approach uh and as as the popularity increases and then a lot of people started um adding um more features um developing more theories so as i said initially the theory was only developed developed for simple material uh brittle elastic material so if we want to apply to nuclear um with um, disposal, you know, the clay, ductile clay, um, and those, <clears throat> that, that kind of um, um, difficult, more, more complex materials uh, cannot be handled yet. But we, we are going to that direction, I, I, I would say. Um, so what, what, what keeps us from applying this approach? Um, so so to, to certain area, uh, we, we can already apply. Uh, so I I apply this for um, some EGS stimulation. Um, so EGS, you know, you know the uh, the granitic rock is more uh, brittle and 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 the uh, response is not that complex. And in in that case, we we could apply. Uh, uh, but um, some 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 complex materials are we that we still um, yeah we are still not there yet. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to questions that Siddhartha asked earlier, and don't want to bypass his, his excellent questions. Um, I'm taking actually his, his third question first. Do you count for injected fluid displacing the resident fluid in the bulks beyond the fracture, especially um, the formation of capillaries, or do you have any knowledge and comments of such modeling efforts? Yeah, so in in my simulation, I I haven't done multi phases, um, but um, there are another research group who also uses this phase flow method. Um, they 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 do multi phase flow. Uh, so one one example I showed uh, this um, discussion driven crack. It's it's um, we we applied Richard assumption, so it's kind of a simplified multi-phase flow. So air, air pressure is considered um, ambient pressure and we only consider um, water pressure. So so that was a uh, simplified multi-phase flow. Uh, and that uh, we, in in my in our code, um, we don't have a multi-phase capability, but some other research groups do have multi-phase um, capabilities. Okay. Thank you. And we have a, one of the questions that Caitlin Chalk asked, and thank you for a great talk. Is it possible to simulate fracture closing with a phase field method? Yeah. Okay. So, 
Okay, so I have to be careful. So if if the closing is simply meaning that uh, you know um, this elastic response, so if we inject into crack and then if the crack opens and then we shut in the well or we uh, um, produce the fluid back and then then the crack can close and and so that that is possible. Uh, but if we are talking about um, um, like a clay clay rock, you know, um, so after drying, uh, it may develop some cracks, and then then we can moisturize the crack again, and and, and uh, because of the sweating, uh, it can close the crack, um, and that part uh, we are still working on it. I um, so this 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 will be not the simple elastic response. We we need to consider some um, swelling and, and, and the shrinkage um, response in the clay. And that, that part we 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 actually work working on it now, but uh, not not yet. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then we have time for one last question. We take this back to um, Siddhartha. Um, he was wondering and just for my understanding, can you please elaborate a bit on the slide on the energy release rate of a deflecting fracture? Okay, so for for a fracture, when when a crack, oh, okay, this is this is not this 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 is a general discussion, not only the hydraulic fracturing, but the, when a crack hits some discontinuity. Um, so it has a choice whether it penetrates or it deflects along the discontinuity. And uh, this choice is made based on essentially which situation releases more energy. And the crack always takes the path that releases more energy. So in that slide, I simply computed um, energy release rate of deflecting crack and penetrating crack. And then I, I compare that en energy release rate. And then I, I found that um, energy release rate of the def deflecting crack increases if increases with the distance from the well bore. Okay. So that's, that's what I found in that slide. Thank you. I think these are all the questions we had from the audience and um, certainly also answered my questions and we have, brings us pretty much right bang on time to 4 p.m. So thank you again, Kata, um, for a really nice talk, very instructive talk on, on the challenges and fantastic, fantastically interesting approaches to modeling crack propagation fracture initiation, which we have sort of looked at this in a far distance and I always found it's a topic that's way too complex for me to understand. Um, so sort of nothing but the highest admiration for people who will tackle it. Thank you to our audience for um, a lot of interesting questions. And Maren, over to you for some final comments announcing our next speaker. Yeah, yeah. thank you also from my side. Uh, I always appreciate to bridge the gap from the theory to the applied side, which we had today. So also thank you to the audience having you here. It was, was great today. And we welcome you next week again. Next week, we will have Jens Böckholzer from the Lawrence Berkeley Lab we will talk on the subsurface energy applications and we look forward to see you again. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.